What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 379. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources. And joining me on the line, just like every single week, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, how are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. That's good. That's good. We've got a a show that was uh, asked for a lot. Uh, we mentioned it last week when we did some Modern Masters previews, and uh, and people said we want a primer show for this. We don't like to do the set reviews um, for these ones because uh, our audience doesn't get a chance to draft these sets that often, and uh, going card by card is a, a huge lift, um, and without that much of a payoff. But what I what we do like to do is touch on. Uh, the overall themes of the set, the things that uh, that we notice about how these sets type of work to try to get you as prepared as possible for when you sit down uh, to do your first Modern Masters draft. And I think for most of our audience, also your last Modern Masters draft, as most <laughs> yes. of us tend to do about one because uh, so, it's pretty expensive. I mean, it's 10 bucks a pack for the for the real life packs and seven on Magic Online. So it's no joke. Um, to, to, you know, shell out that kind of money just to do a booster draft. But some of the cards are worth a lot, and uh, it's certainly a fun format, especially uh, for Magic Online. So this week we are going to dive into our Matter, Modern Masters 2017 edition primer show. Um, before we do, I want to mention our sponsor, Channel Fireball. Com. They are the place to go to get well, Modern Masters if you want it. Uh, you can go, uh, you know, order it up once it's ready to go on Channel Fireball, along with everything else. Uh, sealed product, singles, all that kind of stuff you can find on channelfireball.com. Also free content. This is what, one of the things that really drew me to Channel Fireball when it first came out. Because I was around, in fact, you know, we, we were, I had just come back to Magic about a year prior to when Channel Fireball uh, came into existence. And we were starting the podcast around the similar time as well. And I remember going there to read some of the articles. And I got to tell you, they've come a long way as well. Uh, you know, we've got some of the best players in the world straight up on Channel Fireball at this point, uh, doing content, doing videos. You know, you got your Owen Turtonwalds, you got your Ben Stark just did his big <clears throat> uh, Ether Revolt draft breakdown. And, uh, and uh, yeah, he's, he's pretty famous for doing those because what he'll do is kind of bide his time, wait until the dust is settled in a format, and then give you his full take on it color by color and with an overview as well. And you can find that up on ChannelFireball.com right now. Also, the show is brought to you by you via the Patreon. That's right. You can support the show directly. You know, this is a, a fantastic website that came out a few years ago uh, that's in the same vein as like a Kickstarter. It helps uh, <clears throat> people who are creating things to get funded, basically. And it was made more for people that do repeat things. They create things over and over again, like we do podcasts, uh, songs, web comics, that kind of thing. And it lets you give back to the things that just make your day a little better. Uh, Luis and I look forward to hanging out with you once a week. And uh, if, if you look forward to hanging out with us and uh, you want a, a way to give back, this is a nice proper channel with which to do it. Uh, Patreon.com slash limited resources where you can find that. One of the things that you get, of course, <clears throat> you get access to the Patreon question of the week thread. This goes up once every month or two. And we take questions from this to be answered <clears throat> on the show. So this one comes from Nitsen Popper who says, I love this question, by the way, Luis. This is a question that we, I haven't seen before, and uh, and it really kind of struck a chord with me as one that we should uh, focus on. So we may take a little extra time on this question. He says, hey, Marshall and Luis, I've been noticing an issue with my play recently. I'm having trouble forming and maintaining a plan when the late game arrives and both players are top decking. I, I, I keep planning based on the board and thinking in terms of if nothing changes. Any tips? I'm thinking ahead with no information from the hands. Thanks. So th this to me is a, a really cool question because uh, one of the things that we hammer really hard on the show is to have a plan, right? When you're th sitting there and you're thinking where through the game, you should be understanding what your role is, where uh, you see the game going most likely, and and how you can find a way to win through those scenarios, or at least give yourself the best chance of winning, even though even if sometimes that chance isn't very big. But one of the things that does happen as well is the game goes very long and you find yourself in a scenario where you don't have any cards in hand. Your opponent doesn't have any cards in hand. You're both drawing off the top of your library. And, you know, a lot of times the criteria that we use to decide what my game plan is, is 
What if nothing changed from here? Do we win this damage race? Assuming nothing changed. Uh, am I ahead on board? Uh, assuming nothing changes, yes or no. And when you when both players are top decking, that becomes a lot more difficult. Uh, the, the board can change dramatically from draw step to draw step as people drawing lands do nothing and people drawing spells start adding significantly to the board. And, uh, you know, it really puts a lot of pressure on knowing what you have in your library. Um, but of course, you, you won't really know what your opponent has in their library. Uh, at all. So this is a completely different scenario than you find yourself normally where it's like turn three, you've got four cards in hand, so do they. There's a board state developing, there's a land situation forming. Now all of a sudden you're, you're just, you can look at the board and evaluate that as known information, but the top decks can wildly change the way that things go. So where do you, uh, where do you come down on this, Luis? When you get yourself into that late game position, how do you form a plan when you don't have a hand anymore? <clears throat> Part of it is actually a uh... I always do this. You can actually see this in my videos. I always know what the best card in my deck to draw is, and I'm always just chanting for it because I feel like that increases the odds of me, me drawing it. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't actually, but it is good to know what you're drawing to. So that's what you should be planning on, and this is part of knowing your deck well. So let's say your best card is a giant flyer that will kill your opponent in two hits. Maybe you want to kill their like 2-3 flyer instead of killing their 3-3 ground creature. So you have to be thinking that way. Or if your your best out is like a sweeper, maybe you're better off chump blocking instead of trading. Like they're attacking you with a 5-5 five five and a 2-2, two two, you have a 2-2. Two two. Often you're better off just chumping the 5-5 five five and just hoping to draw the sweeper, especially if that gets you an extra turn. Wait, you, you're trying to make an entire game plan based around what the best possible draw is, but you have 30, you know, you have 20 something cards in your library. You're only going to hit that one out of, you know, very well, rarely. It depends on, on how much you're losing or, or winning by. But the more you're losing by, the more I plan on just drawing my best cards because I see. let's say that, let's say in that previous situation, they've got a giant creature and some small creatures and you have a small creature. Often you're better off preserving your life till just assume you're going to draw your sweeper because you're just going to lose. Otherwise, they have like four creatures and you have none. Uh, besides drawing your best card, though, you should also just try to think of like what kinds of cards you do have to draw, like removal, for example. So if you have two daring demolitions in your uh, in your deck, but you also have like two cruel finalities. You really have to think of what kind of creatures you want to kill because some of your removal will hit those creatures and some won't. It, it changes a lot if you have zero daring demolitions and two cruel finalities, then all of a sudden you're a lot more hesitant to use good removal on an X2. Uh, the other thing is you can't really plan for like a sequence of cards very well. So you, you're going to have to end up being in situations where what do you do if you if the other thing happens? If you draw two lands in a row, what's your best chance to win there? It's actually pretty complicated to play with no hand <laughs> because very you much just have so. so yeah you have so much more unknown information. When you have five cards in your hand, you can plan your next couple turns, and then when you draw cards that make those plans better or worse, you adjust for them. When you have no cards, you have to like almost plan for the entire range of scenarios in the best way you can. And sometimes it's clear cut. It's if I draw a land, I'm dead, so I'm not drawing land. Sometimes it's less so. You're like well. This plays better if I draw a land, but worse if I draw an action spell. Whereas if I draw my best card, then I want to make this play instead. And there's no real like cut and dried, you know, this is when you do you do X here. But, at, you know, we've touched on this a lot. Just be a good – the best way to do this is having a good gauge on how much you're winning and how much you're losing, what you need to win the game, and play to that at the base level. What about uh, trying to figure out what your opponent might draw? Uh, I've got kind of two different lines of thought here. Uh, one of them is, well, you just don't know, right? Uh, you, you'll have yeah. <laughs> not that much information about your opponent's uh, deck. Maybe you've written down a couple of cards that you've seen, but even then, so what? So that isn't really something that you want to uh, invest too much time into. Uh, they're probably going to show it to you once they draw it anyway. So you know, you're not really getting ahead by thinking about it. But the other thing that I do come up with sometimes is... Uh, it's funny that this creature doesn't exist, but I think of an average creature. And what I mean by that is if I'm going to make a play, uh, you know, that is destroyed if my opponent uh, draws an air quotes average creature, call it a two, three or four <laughs> drop of reasonable stats, right? A two, two, a three, three, you know, maybe it maybe a two, three, a three, two, you know, a three, four, you know, somewhere just in this sort of middling range of okay creatures. Um, again, I'm not actually trying to anticipate that specific creature coming, but just a creature, something that my opponent will likely have in their deck. Uh, you know, most people run, you know, 13 to 17 creatures or whatever. And a lot of those are commons and a lot of those fit this criteria. And if I'm trying to form a game plan, 
And I say, well, what if my opponent draws a creature like that? Does that ruin my plan? Then that will actually have an effect on, on how I proceed going forward because it, it is not at all unlikely that they draw something like that. I'm really not willing to commit much more uh, you know, to what types of cards they can draw because obviously there's a big difference between if they draw a two drop or a six drop in the late game. Um, there's And there's other types of spells that they can draw that aren't those creatures. But I do think of that. I do think like if I attack with everything here and they draw a creature or, a, you know, it, it, how much does that change things? Um, and then there's other less common things like removal spells and stuff like that, which I tend to not play around because I just kind of, you know, I figure, Hey, you got to make me see that. But it, it's, I don't think it's a, you know, unlikely that your opponent might draw, you know, kind of a, a, a common creature, let's call it. Yeah. You, it, the situation you're describing is well, pretty common where you're like, if I make this attack and then they draw any chump blocker, I lose. That's not a great situation yeah. to be in, especially since like, <clears throat> a little less than half the cards in their deck get them out of that because it's either a creature or a removal spell. There aren't that many other options, right, if you're not drawing right. a land. So that is something to be aware of. Uh, the other thing is later in the match, you'll have much more information. In game one, I really don't worry about most things. Like, I, I've, I've mentioned this before. I don't play around all that much if I don't have to. And what I mean is that I just often put my opponents on having nothing because they have nothing a lot more than they have something. And I, I don't want to give away equity by, like, Making a play, you're like, I don't want to make a play that loses to a top deck and removal spell and they have no cards in hand. It's like, how many removal spells are I going to have in their deck? Like four? On the other hand, if I know that they have like a sweeper in their deck, then yes, I probably won't play my fifth creature when they have two in play. So it, there's a lot difference between game one where I just like kind of just try to figure out what they have, but just assume it's not a whole lot versus later in the match when I have a lot more information. I'm like, well, this person has like three haste creatures. So maybe I'll leave back an extra blocker because I don't want to die to that. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Uh, in, in poker, there's a, there's a term we have for people like that. Uh, they're called calling stations. They're, they're people who uh, just kind of – you make a big bet and they just call every time and say, OK, show me a good hand. And uh, in Magic, I'm very much <laughs> oh, a calling I'm, station. I'm a, yeah. I'm a total calling station. Uh, I'm a I huge like... station too. Yeah, because the fact of the matter is, is that uh, – especially among intermediate level players, it becomes very easy for you once you understand the set and you've memorized a lot of the tricks and the things that go along with it to be like, oh, well, my opponent could easily have this, you know, like she could, she could just have a removal spell. And, I just you know, have no respect for that. <laughs> yeah. And, and the truth is that one of the ways that you can sort of train yourself to get away from this, and I do believe that you should get away from this, is to think about it from your own perspective. Uh, you know, there are situations that come up in magic where you get a big two for one with a removal spell, right? But those come up very infrequently, right? It is not easy to set up that scenario. You have to have everything line up. You have to have the card in your hand. You have to have the mana to cast it and the creatures have to be, you know, entering combat in certain ways and all these things. And for me, I just want, I, I often just want to make my opponent show it to me. Now, the real question though, and, and this is getting a little deep for this question, but I still think it's worth touching on here, is that it's not that simple. You don't get to just say, well, they probably don't have it, so I'll just, I'll just make, I'll just do the thing that makes them have it. What you really want to be thinking about is, uh, two different factors that you're kind of putting on the scale. On one of them, is how bad is it for you if they do have it? That, that's a huge question. I mean, if you just lose the game on the spot if they have it, uh, that's really, you know, risky play that you might not need to make. And then, you know, conversely, the other side of the scale is, do you need to make this play? Like, let's just say uh, that, you know, if your opponent has this removal spell, they completely destroy you, but you're super far ahead and you just have no... Uh, you know, you're, you're at 18 life and they're attacking you for right. two and sure you can block, <laughs> you but if got a it, four, four flyer, you're like, well, I'll make them have it. It's like, no, you really don't want to there. Right. And there you really don't want to, because the truth is the only way that they can get out of this is if they have it. And, and if you open that door, so there are a lot of things to weigh this, of course, isn't as simple, but I I'm with Luis on that baseline of just kind of being a calling station in general, which is just saying, look, you have to show me that you have it. And, you know, another scenario that pops up just as a, as a last example here is, you know, the, the classic where you just, you play a two, three and your opponent has a two, two, you pass and they go, okay, attack you with it. And you're I like, oh, they that. could have it. I block often there. And part of the reason, again, is I'm putting that half of the scale up is how bad is this for me if they have it? 
And the truth is, it's not that bad at all. If they have it, then they get to trade their combat trick or whatever it is for my creature, which is like, okay, you know, that's going to happen at some point anyway. And they have to use their mana on their turn to do it, which might stunt their growth. So for me, I'm like, eh. And then the times when they, they're bluffing and they don't have it, it's a huge blowout. I mean, you know, if they just throw away a creature for some reason. So, you know, for me, I do always try to weigh out, well, you know, how bad is it for me if they have it? And, and do I, am I really incentivized to make these plays? But my baseline is I'm going to make them have it because it's just hard to have it. It's just that simple. And going back to the question, when they're top decking, I never give them credit for it ever. Oh, yeah. Like it's a land or something, you know, I'm just like, whatever, you, you don't have it. And, uh, and I just make them show it to me and I'm perfectly willing to lose a game, uh, in that fashion as well. I, I have no, no problem with that. I have one last thing on the subject is, uh, bluffing is overrated. The vast majority of limited decks should play out all their lands in case you draw like a draw two spell, you know, something like that, that you're not expecting and end up in a situation where you just have an extra land in hand and you're one mana short of playing something. So, yeah. So don't, don't just hold three lands in your hand because you want to bluff because first of all, we're sitting here telling you that we're not going to respect your bluffs anyway. Right. <laughs> Second, Second, if you draw like a draw three and you have not played your lands and you're a mana short of casting your six drop in the same turn as your draw three, that's just disaster. I've seen so many people lose to that and I've lost to it myself. Yeah, for sure. All right, Nitsen, thanks a lot for the uh, for the question. That was a, a really great question, and we appreciate it. Again, if you want to be able to put your questions in for question of the week, um, just head over to the Patreon. You can sign up for any amount, a dollar, a show. Uh, we'll get you access to all of this stuff. Um, it also gets you entered into our giveaways, and I've got a uh, Patreon giveaway here. This is a... Uh, what are these things called? Uh, From the Vault, Angels. So this is uh, kind of sweet. It's got some cool stuff in it. Uh, and uh, I've got a giveaway here. And this one's going to go to Andrea Biaggi. This is uh, from uh, from San Diego. Thank you so much, Andrea. We really appreciate your support of the podcast. And I will Actually, be, uh, I have a question. If, yeah. if, if Andrea is already lucky enough to live in San Diego, should we really be also giving them uh, from the vault? Uh, that's like, like really good. Should I take it back? Yeah, maybe we should just do a redraw. Like, yeah, we should do a you're redraw. Already in, you're already in San Diego. Like, what else do you need? No kidding. Talk about greedy, Andrea, honestly. <laughs> no, I guess it's already set in stone. We'll go ahead and let Andrea have this one. Uh, but ne next winner from San Diego, I'll, yeah. I'll probably send it to you too. Anyway. <laughs> All right, let's do a crack a pack real quick uh, before we get into some Modern Masters talk. This one comes from Willie. Thank you, Willie. I did not, we did not write down where I met you, Willie, but I'm assuming things. If it's Willie Edel, probably Brazil. Uh, yeah, no, that wasn't it either. Um, all right, first first card off. Finally, we have a good first card. We've been having some real junkers. Uh, Caught in the Brights. Uh, yeah, this is a fine card. Uh, this is one of the better white commons. Depending on who you ask, it's either like the best one or Dawnfeather Eagle. You yeah. know, either way, a first pickable card, but not one I'm thrilled with. I, I just don't love the pacifisms in this format. I like them. I'm, I'm into this. This is, I mean, obviously it's our, our first pick now. Precise Strike. Nope. No, definitely not. Okay, here's here's a here's a conversation. Ether Swooper. I like Ether Swooper more than Cotton the Brights. Uh, it enables I improvised cards very very well. Uh, it's also just a good energy sink, and it's just a good card. Is you get a lot for two mana. I I'm a big fan of this card. Yeah, I like it a lot too. It's close for me between that and Cotton the Brights. They're they're currently in the arena. Uh, well, Knight it, go ahead. The Ether Swooper is also good at uh, shutting down opposing Whirler Makers, which is important because that's just one of the God, key cards in the format. Come on, uh, Night Market Aeronaut, another Whirler Maker stopper somehow, but uh, no. No, uh, no. It's not by the way, Whirler Maker looking great here. Here's Silk Weaver Elite. <laughs> oh yeah. Every Whirler card Maker. we've we've gotten just smashes. Whirler. Silk Weaver Elite still not a good card. <laughs> yes, it it is not. How about this one? Destructive Tampering. <laughs> it also kills Whirler <laughs> Maker somehow. Well, see, the the, the 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 key to this format is Whirler Maker. So I I really evaluate every card in the lens of how does it interact with Whirler Maker. Okay, so Destructive Tampering is very high on your list then. Yes, but I'd still take Ether Swooper. <laughs> All right. Uh, Loth New Sailback. Uh, it That's gets chunked by Whirler Maker every turn, so not not a high pick. I, yeah. I would rather have Ether Swooper. All right. Well, uh, I got bad news uh, for Iron Tread Crusher, our next card. Oh, that's even worse. But the other, on the other hand, if you make three Thopters, you can crew it, so it gets a little bit of a bonus when working with Whirler Maker. All right. I would still take Ether Swooper. Uh, Universal Solvent, no. Oh, well, it destroys Whirler Maker though, so that's actually pretty important. Actually, you're right. It does. Uh, Night Market <laughs> Guard. Blocks, uh, block zero thopters. This one interacts very poorly with Whirler Maker, so it's immediately discounted. <clears throat> um, all right, now we've got some some serious business here. Very good against Whirler Maker. Untethered Express. Well, this is just very good. Also, uh, Untethered Express, the clear front runner. Yeah, here. I just uh, moved all the other cards back to the side. Um, 
Oh, combo. Not really. Aerial modification. The one that gives your vehicle or creature plus two, plus two, and flying. The thing is the Thopters from Warlord Maker already have flying, so you don't actually really want this in your Warlord Maker deck. And then against Warlord Maker, you just get chumped by the Thopters, so really just not good overall. All right, so we're still on Untethered Express, is that? Yeah, it, mainly because it has Trample, so it gets a, 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 a past the Thopter tokens. Here's an, this is a discussion that I think, uh, like, I know where I sit, but uh, I think some people may argue a Pacification Array. This is the heck well, of a I like pack the, we've got here. Mike, I right. like the card. It, it is quite good. Uh, Untethered Express is better, and the problem with Pacification Array is it can only tap down one Thopter per turn, and if you have it on your side with Whirler Maker, you can't activate both, so really doesn't interact well with or against Whirler Maker. All right, well, I've got uh, our, our Rare, which is actually another very good card uh, and very good against Whirler Maker, is Carry Zev Skyship Raider. Carry Zev is quite good. Uh, you know, Raghavan getting to attack them for two damage a turn, I suppose. Uh I'm, I, I would still just take Untethered Express here. I would, too. This is a hell of a pack, though. Pacification Array, Carries of Untethered Express, and that's leaving behind an Iron Trek Crusher, a Caught in the Brights, and an Ether Swooper as well. Yeah. Oof. That's a really good pack. But the, 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 the great thing about Untethered Express, it doesn't commit you to anything. Yeah. So, uh, I, since we're, I, I can promise that we're not going to evaluate every single uh, Cracker Pack under the, 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 the lens of Roller Maker, but it was useful to do it as an in instructional exercise for this one. Yeah, well, we, we, we kind of smashed the Roller Maker, though. I think that uh, your, your contention that Roller Maker is an important card in the format seems to be failing here, as most of the cards were very good against it. Yeah, but they're also good with it. Yeah. You can crew Untethered Express with the Thopter. You could just end that sentence at, they're also good. Uh, okay, let's get into our main topic here. This is, uh, again, one that we had <clears throat> requested many times uh, since we did the show last week. This is the Modern Masters 27 edition primer. So a uh, quick uh, overview <laughs> on Modern Masters. Probably 2017, but yeah. Uh, sorry, 2017 edition primer. Thank you. Um, uh, so... so it, this has uh, 249 cards in it. It comes out on March 17th, 2017 for release on Magic Online uh, five days after that on March 22nd. This is the third in the series of Modern Masters. Um, this set is in, is comprised entirely of reprints. So these are there's no new cards in Modern Masters. They're all picked from previous sets. And usually they've, they kind of group some of the sets that they pick from. They did that here for sure. Uh, definitely some Shards of Alara happening. Uh, in in this set, uh, these sets are carefully curated by R and D for limited, while still letting the key reprints for constructed uh, in. Uh, you know, so these are no joke. Uh, I think that you know some people look at these and say, "Well, this is just a way that Wizards can get some modern staples in the hands of the players that want them," and that is definitely one of the 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 uses that I, I think for these sets. But uh, but they are absolutely they put a full development team on these things, you know, to make sure that they're. Uh, awesome for limited because they know that people love to play with these old sets. Uh, they tend to come in somewhere between a very powerful normal set and cube draft. Um, but they're very much in between. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't like when you draft these sets, they, it doesn't feel the same as cube feels. And it certainly doesn't feel the same as a, a regular one. Do you agree with that, Luis? Yeah. What, what I would say is the difference is normal limited you you look at a card like Daring Demolition, you're like, okay, this is a removal spell. Cool, removal spells are good. Or like, oh, look, uh, you know, four mana, three, three flyer. Like, this is a great card. This is just going to – It's good. and that's true across basically all the normal limited sets, right? Removal is good. Cheap, you know, efficient creatures are good, et cetera. In cube is, on the other hand, where I'm drafting constructed. I, I have – when I draft the deck, I have specific roles I want to fill. I'm not taking cards just because they're, you know, good. Like, obviously, like – in a power and cube, sure, cards like Ancestor Recall are just great. But like in general, in cube, I always have a game plan. I'm drafting to it. Modern Masters is closer to the cube end than the normal limited end. Uh, I remember last, you know, Modern Masters Grand Prix. Actually, I drafted green white tokens, for example, in the second draft. Mm -hmm. I did not take a card that didn't fit in the green white tokens deck game plan. Like I didn't take random giant growths. You know, I didn't take random four mana four fours. Like. Those right. cards might seem good, but that's just not what that was about. I took all cards that generated tokens and overruns, and that was basically it. Yeah. Because you're drafting a constructed deck, and you're still getting limited gameplay. Like, this isn't just completely alien to limited. Certainly not. But the draft portion, at least, is a lot more tightly focused. And if this Modern Masters is like either of the previous two, I would expect 
you to kind of fall in line with that when you're drafting a specific archetype. Yeah, and that is how it is. Uh, s- some other uh, big picture stuff before we get into the details uh, of, of, of this set. The average card quality is much higher than a normal set. That does lead to some differences, some of the ones <laughs> that Luis just said. But also, uh, it means that the scramble for playables is a lot more tolerable. You have a lot more flexibility. Cardboard, uh, sideboard slots matter. Land slots matter. This will remind you of Cube if you've ever done that. Um, you also have to kind of recalibrate where to use that previous example, four mana four four is a card like colorless four mana four four is not a card I would cut from any limited deck in a normal format. It frequently in modern masters I I would not have played that card, and I, I think that it's going to be true here too. What you think is good, is, I mean it might be, but what you think is good is not going to be as good as it is because yes. just everything is better. Like you know, in, to go again to go back to like modern masters one for example, you had affinity and you had you, or. In Modern Masters 2, actually, I also had Affinity. Either way, <laughs> you, you had Affinity and, you know, you'd have two mana 4-4s. Four so a four mana 4-4 four is clearly behind the curve. Right. Um, additionally, R&D will do something that's kind of interesting. They will use what they call rarity shifts. And they happen actually quite often. And what that is is th- they'll take uh, a card that's, say, a rare, and they'll make it an uncommon. And occasionally, th- there is a, one, at least one of these in Modern Masters three as well uh they'll even go from rare to common and yeah. uh you know <laughs> sign of the wild for example mm-hmm. yep that was one and and the the there's a mortician's beetle i think it's called in this one um <laughs> yeah that, that was a dubious rare to begin with though <laughs> indeed indeed uh but some of these you know they, they they really signal strongly that they're trying to push some type of specific archetype when you see a card that was a rare become a common and you can pick up multiples of them um, as louis said linear archetypes will rule the day here the pile of good card stuff doesn't work as well and uh usually each set of colors Usually they're pairs. In this set, it feels like they're pairs, and then there's also some shards, some three-color sets that we've seen. Um, they each have a specific goal. We'll call those lanes. Uh, that's just to tend to be, you know, stay in your lane type thing. Um, and and Luis touched on a few of those already with, you know, some of the archetypes that we've seen in the past. Um, but I will say that uh, go ahead. both of the previous Modern Masters featured at least one archetype that was kind of like good stuff control. But yep. that wasn't that wasn't the typical deck that you would draft, like the five color control deck, for example. And that was specifically there because the mana fixing was good enough that you could just snipe all the good cards. So yes, and and I we'll, we'll talk about yeah. that for this one too because uh, that's a big question mark: is can you play the four or five color deck in the format? And I do have that answer for you a little later here. Um, let's get down into the archetypes. Um, they're kind of broadly broken down, and and this is very like. Things will change from this baseline stance that we have here on day one. Uh, you know, of course, Luis and I, we haven't had a chance to draft this set yet. Yeah, th- th- this list is what's intended by looking at the cards. What yes. What actu- actually happens is not up to that. That's right. <laughs> what it's actually up to happens us. is what's, what's good enough. <laughs> That's right. And it's up to us. So um, I'm just going to go through the list very quickly, but then uh, we'll, we'll talk about a couple of other, a couple of the ones um, a little bit more in depth uh, that I've had a chance to, to read and write about a little bit more. So blue, white is blink. We talked about that last time with the, with our two preview cards, the Miss Raven and momentary blink. So this is, uh, you know, it, exiling and bringing creatures back for value, maybe returning them to your hand. Uh, blue black was instant control. So this is uh, operating at instant speed, able to kill your opponent's threats and even play your own threats at, at instant speed. We've seen fairies be, uh, you know, blue black. That, that doesn't seem to be the case here though. Uh, black red is unearth or sac- and or sacrifice. So this is uh, using the unearth mechanic from Shards of Alara, where if, if a creature with Unearth is in your graveyard, you can pay some mana and get it back for a turn with haste, and then it gets exiled at the end step. But of course, you can attack with it in there, you can sacrifice it, and there's a bunch of different cards in the set that reward you for sacrificing creatures or having your creatures die. Uh, Red Green is a token go wide strategy using cards like Dragon Fodder and some pump, uh, mass pump spells to. Uh, to, to go wide and, and make a bunch of uh, kind of hard hitting tokens. Green white is also a tokens theme with populate and uh, populate is a, a mechanic from uh, what was it? Return to Ravnica. RTR. Yep. Yeah. That lets you uh, make a copy of a token creature that you've got. Uh, and usually the, the, the populate cards will give you the first token and then you can copy that one. Or if you happen yeah. to have something better, you can get a better one. An important distinction between this and like this might look like green white tokens and maybe it'll play out like that is that populate tends to want bigger tokens. It's not an army of saprolings. It's I want to copy my beast token. 
That's right. And then, and make a bunch of those for, for a good value. Um, and then the, the rest, so, so those are the sort of, uh, five main pairs, but then the rest seem to break down into and they're their all, those are all all al- allied colors. Yeah. All allied colors. And then the rest seem to be in the shards from shards of Alara, which were built around one color and then used two adjoining colors to make a, a three color grouping. Um, and it looks like, you know, they kind of just broke those down here. So the first one is a blue, black, white, which we call Esper, of course, uh, which is control with creatures. I mean, you, look, that's pretty vague, right? We're, we're, we'll have to, you know, work our way through that one to figure out what that actually means. I mean, I don't even know what that means. I haven't read that far down in the show notes. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, you have. I can see your, your thing on there. Um, uh, graveyard is the one for, for, uh, for Grixis, which is what you would expect. Uh, that's black, red, blue, of course. Uh, that's the color that had unearth, or sorry, excuse me, the shard that had unearth. So, uh, you know, that, that's something that we'll expect to see is a lot of unearth and uh, abuse of the graveyard there. Jund, which is black, red, green, uh, is the sacrifice one, which is, again, similar to how it was in Shards of Alara. Uh, red, green, white is Naya. That is going to be token aggro, which makes a lot of sense. You know, we talked about populate and token go wide for the the two yeah, decks you smash that make those it. two together and that's yeah good. and so you get a lot of extra uh you know populate stuff going on in token makers out of green and then the last one is bant that's green white blue and that's they called it splicers um this tends to be a, a blink sub theme splicers uh, we'll talk about it in a little bit but they're they're creatures that are one ones and they bring with them a three three golem token and uh, an artifact creature golem token, and uh, you know it leaves behind the creature that made it. So if you can blink those or return them to your hand and recast them, you'll get more and more golems. And each splicer gives the golems uh, each get they give all golems a, a, an ability as well. So you can kind of create this army of super golems if you can set it up. And uh, we'll see how that goes as well. I, again, like, like Louise said um, very astutely, this is kind of the aim, but that doesn't necessarily mean that this is uh, what's going to happen. And then the last archetype that that isn't on here is four or five color. And again, we'll talk about that one in just a little I, bit. I noticed you didn't put the shards in the shard definitive shard order that I said a couple weeks ago. I, I have no idea what it is. Uh, well, that's uh, your loss, I suppose. Uh, okay, <laughs> I'll take the hit. Um, all right, so so let's get into this. Uh, you started to touch on this a little bit before, Luis, um, but we're talking about uh, you know picking archetypes here, right? And and when you sit down to do a draft, or if you happen to be doing a sealed, you can look for these archetypes. But this is really more specific to to booster draft. Um, you, you mentioned it. You know, you're not just necessarily taking cards based on raw power level. You are taking cards that fit into the archetype that you are playing. And uh, what I wanted to mention uh, first off was that there's a few different ways that these uh, these linear archetypes uh, present themselves. They're not all the same. And, and I think this is a, a, a critical distinction here. The first one that comes to mind are the ones that reward critical mass of a certain type of card, or and, and this can be many different things like artifacts, right? Uh, we've seen affinity decks, metalcraft decks that say the more artifacts you have, the better your deck gets in, in a very basic level. Um, and that's, spells. And that's, oh, go ahead. Yeah. And, and what, what something like that really shows as a great example is y- you care less about what those cards do than the fact that you have them and that they're like, you know, somewhat functional because you just want 18 artifacts in this deck. Exactly. So this yes. is ex- exactly why. I mean, this sort of this linear archetype, you know, category is exactly when you will pass the premier removal spell for, a, you know, like a spell bomb, like an ether spell bomb, because you just want a card that makes all the rest of your cards work. Exactly. Uh, token makers is another one. You know, going back to the, uh, uh, an earlier modern masters, they had phallids, right? Th- these, these, do you remember the phallids? They, they just, oh, yeah. you know, get this counters going and do this. But I mean, there's, there were some really mediocre ones like, you know, uh, one and two mana cards that really just didn't look good when you look at them in a vacuum. But when you compile, when you piled them up with a whole bunch of other uh, Thalid makers, all of a sudden the deck really kind of sprung to life and you would be taking these one ones and oh fives and stuff for a couple of mana over these cards that like you said, Hey, it's a four, four for four, you know, a card that you would almost never consider cutting from a normal limited deck. And here you are taking an oh five Thalid that, you know, ge- or a uh, spore generator or whatever that makes these things. It's, it puts you in weird positions. Same things. Like we mentioned the artifacts, Instead of taking some big flying bomb or whatever, you'll take some stupid little one-one modular creature or whatever, just because it's cheap yeah. and it says artifact on it. You know, I mean, you you would take Arcbound Worker over like six mana five-five flyer all day. Exactly. And 
that, that, that's a pick you would never make in a normal limited format, or unless it was something like Mirrodin, which was, I guess, also not a normal limited format. Yeah, it was very linear as well. A, 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 Go ahead. a good way to think about this kind of deck is you have, depending on the, the, the theme, you have only a couple slots for non-theme yeah. cards, so yes. the bar is really high. Like, you you just can't put non-artifacts in the artifact deck or non phalage or tribal cards in the decks that really push those. So if you put a card in like that, it has to be like a Doomblade level of card. Yeah, exactly. Or a bomb that's so powerful, you just can't not put it in your deck. Another one that comes to mind here, Luis, for these super linear but uh, critical mass style decks, tribal cards, right? Yep. I mean, we've seen tons of different tribes in, in Modern Masters represented. So, you know, you can pick up a whole bunch of goblins, you can pick up a whole bunch of elves, fairies, we've seen a bunch of those. And again, these are the type of cards that really reward you for having as many as possible. And it puts less emphasis on, you know, kind of what they are. It, it's quantity over quality, it really is. Yeah. You, you don't care how good your cheap artifacts are. And if you have a good affinity deck, you just care how many you have. That's Whereas right. the, the the second type of deck uh, we're going to talk about here is actually kind of the opposite. Yeah. And uh, that's the one where you have things like a reanimator, for example, where you need a specific combination of cards. You need a discard outlet, a big creature, and a reanimation spell. This is more of like a cube archetype, but this is the exact sort of thing that really pays you off when you combine – a plus B, whereas the first one is just like as many A's as you can get, and then you end up with you know a, a good deck. Here you really need A plus B plus C actually, depending on the deck. And just from like a brief scan, like something like uh, b the blue white blink deck is much more here, where you want a certain number of creatures with enter to battlefield abilities and blinks, and then once you have all those, you end up in a much better spot. Yeah, and like you said, the reanimator or graveyard decks are often similar in that way where you need the big fat creatures to get into the graveyard to get back. You need the reanimation spells to get them back and you need the discard outlets to put them in the graveyard. If you miss any of those pieces, the deck falls apart. So you're, you, you know, what you're evaluating it's, at it's any given time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you, what you're evaluating at any given pick is uh, fluctuating all over the place where you might be opening up pack three and saying to yourself, I'll take any discard outlet I can get yeah I, i've definitely been there where you're just like yeah well uh i've got you know five giant creatures and six reanimation spells but i've got two discard outlets i'll take a discard outlet over yeah like you said anything yeah and so so keep in mind that the, the, those are two different types of uh, archetypes that are still very focused you'll notice that neither of these fit that description of well i'm just going to take the best cards in my colors and see what happens Th that again is not a strategy you're going to want to employ here unless your color is all of the colors um one thing that pops up during the draft format, and it seems to be even more emphasized here than in what we, you know, a normal set, is staying open in these formats is super, super important. And this comes up in a couple of different ways. In a normal draft, you might share like a color, one of your colors with a neighbor, but you're still able, you're still able to make it work because the overlap isn't super strong. Like they're going to take some of the good red cards. You're going to get the rest of them, maybe the, the slightly less good ones. But then your other color, you get all to yourself and so do they. So you, you can both walk away with playable decks. In Modern Masters, if you share an archetype with a neighbor, you're screwed. And so are they uh, in many cases. I mean, if they're the one on your right, then they're less so than you. But still, you can really train wreck each other. So – you have to be willing to stay open. And when you, you know, get that, that signal or that, that sign that things are flowing, it's good. And here's a couple of the reasons for that. First, first off, if you do stay open longer, you will be more rewarded than normal for finding the lane that's open because you're going to get cards that are really important for your deck late because you know what? Nobody else wants them, right? Exactly. We, we just talked about Arcbound Worker, right? There's one deck in that format that wanted it and nobody else wanted it ever. So if you were the one who found that lane and you were in the affinity deck, you could get that card whenever you wanted. And even and, and that was a, a low example. I mean, you can get some really sick cards for your deck as long as they're the ones that nobody else wants and you can oh, get them I, very late. I remember, I mean, you can sometimes get cards you would be willing to first pick with two cards left in the pack because they're yes. just a blank card to everyone else at the table. Yeah, and that's and such that just a huge deal. In normal limited form formats. Yeah, it just like, never you, you happens. You never end like up that. in a position where you, you, your great cards are just straight up zeros. But it's funny that, uh, you know, assuming there's like 10 viable archetypes in, in this format, 
a table of eight people, if they if they cooperate perfectly, all eight people have just like an absurd deck. Be, you know, assuming like normal distribution and all, all the archetypes being powerful, if everyone's in a different one, it is pretty funny that that could work out that way. Yeah, that's that's really going to be how it works out. And sometimes you just won't have enough of a certain card open. Not everyone's going to have a good deck, etc. But it's really, really, really powerful to be in an open deck, which is way more amplified than a normal limited format, which is why what you're saying is exactly correct. You just, you can't afford to, to be sitting next to someone drafting the same deck as you, or you're both just going to end up with such a worse deck. Yeah. The other thing to keep in mind as far as keeping open goes is that it's going to be okay. <laughs> Again, I mentioned this earlier, but I want to reiterate it here because it's important for this point, which is that with the average card quality being so much higher and with the fact that there's so many more good playable cards in the format you can actually afford to stay open longer i've had situations where i didn't know what deck i was going to be until halfway through pack one if that was the case for a normal draft format i'd be a little nervous i you know you'd probably think well i can scrape something together but my sideboard isn't going to be much or i'm, I'm going to have to sweat the last pack here you're fine if you found the right lane you're going to have more than enough playables by the time you get to the end. Now, that isn't the ideal scenario. Uh, you know, you, you don't want to waste those early picks if you can help it. But I'm telling you, if you do pick up the right signals and you can switch into a lane that is open, into an archetype that is open, you're going to be greatly rewarded and you have a little bit more wiggle room than you would in a normal set just because uh, of how much, <clears throat> uh, because of the higher uh, card quality. And uh, that, yeah. go ahead. Well, what I was going to say is that it's not even it's not even just the higher card quality. It's the fact that if you do correctly identify the the open deck, you're also just going to get flooded with cards that you want. Yeah, no one else does. Totally. Like, like we said before, that was the, that's the rule. Yeah. Uh, one of the one of the concepts I like to bring up um, for these is is a, I, 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 this is just what I call I call them pivot cards. These are cards uh, that come up in these type of formats that are really really infor- important because they're first pick quality cards that can go into multiple archetypes. Now, there's not that many that do this. Uh, usually there's not that many at all, in fact, but they're really important to know about because they let you first pick a card that can take you in different directions. You know, if you first pick a heavy artifact theme card, usually you're just, that's the direction that you can go. And, and if you have to switch directions because that archetype isn't open, you just scrap that first pick. But there's a few cards in each of these sets that aren't like that, that you can pick and, uh, and you can find different ways to go through. Uh, you know, one of them that, that really stood out to me in this set is Flicker Wisp, which is a card that you can use to, you know, uh, blink. Uh, it doesn't actually blink it. It exiles a, a permanent and then brings it back uh, on the end step. But Man, it is so powerful to be able to do this in this blue-white blink deck, which is kind of where its home sits. But there's a lot of other options, too. Like we talked about this Splicers deck where, you know, you can blink it. It also, you know, kills tokens and does a whole bunch of really cool stuff like that. great in the tokens deck if they have, like, any creatures that make tokens, like the tokens deck, like Splicers, I guess, uh, which do double duty also. Yeah. Yeah. this is the exact kind of card that you want to highlight because it's so important to know know what these cards are, and they're not always obvious. Like this list that we have here, that we're going to go through is is a good start. But as you play the format, you know, or or read about the format, depending on how many drafts you're going to end up doing, identifying the pivot cards is is more critical here than any other format because, like you said, there's just so many times when you have to waste your first picks trying to find the open deck. Taking a card like another one example is Path to Exile. It's just going to be a great card that's just so efficient that. It can go in multiple decks, and you're going to be happy with it. It doesn't force you to waste a pick, and you get a first pick quality card. Whereas, if you're taking like you know a momentary blink effect, and then you end up in like Esper Control, like you're just not going to be as happy with it. That's right. Yeah, a couple other cards that came to mind though, uh, like Louise said, that this is very much uh, to be determined. But cards like Vampire Nighthawk, Vithian Stinger, Penumbra Spider, these are high power level cards that can go into. Any deck that can cast them, I don't know if they're going to end up being pivot cards, but they're the kind of cards that I look out for to see if that's the case. Um, but yeah, Flicker Wisp is really the one that kind of uh, kind of uh, stood out to me. All right, let's talk a little it's bit a, it's, about it's a legacy. Yeah, a card's really, really good. It's really good. I mean, it kills token. The fact it's just that it fantastic. Flicker's opponent stuff is very different than almost all the other cards, like you know, Restoration Angel type mm-hmm. cards or Wisp Weaver Angel type cards. So remember that you can do that. It is a, it is a token killer. Yeah, get stuff out of the way. 
to uh, push through a bunch of damage even too. All right, let's talk about this, uh, widening the lane a little bit. We've been talking about the archetypes Use and free, stuff. The, the freeway metaphor even further. <laughs> yeah, but uh, exactly. But let, let's talk a little bit about four or five color decks because, Luis, I know you and I both think of that right away when we think of these formats. Is I, I do like it when these are an option and are, are they I an option the here? Thing. Yeah, right. That's all I. Uh, <laughs> you you want to be mono black goblins. Uh, so, so what what are you seeing here for for four or five color decks in Modern Masters uh, three? Ten gates at common. So these are dual lands. Uh, yep. Five tri lands at uncommon, which are critical to archetypes like this. Uh, Ten signets at uncommon, which are just going to be super powerful in any two color deck that has both colors. Even if you only one of the colors, like a blue white signet, in your like, you know a blue black deck like that is actually going to be fine a lot of the time too because they do ramp you yeah uh so signets i think are just going to be a high pick overall so i wouldn't basically signets are gonna be a high pick so i wouldn't count on those but tri lands a lot of people are just not going to want the tri lands even though if you're two of the three colors they're still good usually people i mean it's, a, it's realize, a gate yeah it's the same thing as one of the gates i don't think right? realize how bad your mana is limited when you're just the normal nine eight your mana is not good like that's just not good mana no. so having the opportunity to have two tap lands that produce both your colors actually significantly helps. Um, design perspective from you here. Uh, signets are uncommon. What, what do you make of that? They, they were common in their original printing. Yeah, they were common. I think that was fine because Ravnica had such powerful mana fixing and it, it had the bounce lands at common way better than the signets. Uh, I do like them at uncommon because signets at common really put pressure on just having on the low cost cards because the four and five mana cards get so much better when you can always get two signets that it really make me makes the curve kind of skip that the two to three drop range a lot more often which i don't think is great i think that's an okay experience sometimes but if it's just happening too often in across all five colors because they're colorless that's not as fun as sometimes having two drops and three drops be relevant in your deck and you know being able to compete with your opponent's cards Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm also a fan of no signets in cube for what it's worth, for, for basically the same reason. Yeah, just because it opens it up to colors that don't normally get it. It also means that green is the better, best at color fixing, which like this is particularly true in cube, but I like that, that being green's domain, as it were. Uh, yeah. it's, not as, it's not as cool if like you can just always draft Grixis with a bunch of signets and you get to play three or four colors without touching green. Like That's part of green's thing. So I, I, Signets are great, except on... Uh, on Magic Online, tapping signets is the worst thing in the entire yeah, world. I do uh, hate that. Well, you have to do less of it here <laughs> since they're uncommon. Yeah, but I, I like them in uncommon, and I like them not in cube for, for what that's worth. So let's talk a little bit about this five-color, four, four or five-color deck. So th the way this tends to work is uh, if you are willing to dedicate picks early to cards like the Trilands and the Signets and then to a certain extent the Gates as well, um, you can kind of – put together a pretty cool strategy. Basically what I try to do, this is a very basic level. Of course, you know how everybody knows how complicated booster draft is. So there's no, you know, five second explanation that, that gets you every pick, but this is the baseline for what I do. I look for super powerful bombs or fantastic cards in my pack. If I don't see those, and I'm talking about cards that can generate massive card advantage or take over a game or are just wildly efficient, these type of cards, you know, really top tier stuff. If I don't see those, I take a color fixer. So I look at my pack and I'm like, okay, what's the rare? Oh, it's not a very good one. Or is there any sweet uncommons? Not really. Uh, okay, I'll take a Triland. And now I've got a Triland, but no spells to cast with it yet. And I'll keep doing this. And the idea is, is that there's not that many great cards to pick. So you'll end up with some of them, say five or 10 or whatever. And by the time you get to pack three, you'll have a bunch of really powerful stuff and then a ton of fixing. You'll know kind of what your mana capabilities are. Then when you open up pack three, you just take the best card, period, out of the pack. Just whatever it is, you take it, and you just keep doing that for the whole rest of the pack. It doesn't have to be pack three, by the way. This can happen anytime you feel comfortable with your mana. Um, of course, this introduces a significant level of risk to your draft, as if you don't get the mana fixing, it all falls apart. Sometimes you end up going into pack three needing that mana fixing. You've already got all the big bombs, but you don't have any fixing that, that, yet. That's the place you don't want to be. Yeah, that is a scary place to be as well. Uh, there's a ton of gold cards in the format, and there's even quite a few like three color plus cards in the format as well. So these are all things that you're going to have to balance out. But as far as a baseline strategy goes, that is that is kind of how I tend to do it. Um, and assuming that there's enough and that you're able to do it, 
or, or you're willing to do it, you will end up with a pretty cool deck uh, some percentage of the time. Other times you won't be able to cast your spells and you'll feel like an idiot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this does happen. This, deck, this does sound, you know, on surface level, like the kind of deck they're like, well, how are you going to get your good cards late? They're not that focused. But first of all, the fact that you can snap up gold cards, sometimes there's just no one's going to be an Esper and you're going to get an Esper colored gold card, you know, seventh pick. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes, sometimes you're also going to have a table full of people drafting these really focused decks and not caring about the generic powerful cards, and you just get to take the best of those. So th this is linear in that sense. You're not just uh, hoping to get past good cards exactly. Yeah, that's right. Another thing to consider is that you do tend to take the control route since it takes you a while to get your mana set up and since you have more powerful late game. So if you do see an awesome card make sure that it's an awesome card that can fit into your strategy. You know, if you see some right. hyper-aggressive two-drop that costs two different colors of mana, that's probably not up your alley, even if it is a, a really good card uh, in general. So keep that in mind as well. But I'm telling you, based on what I'm seeing here, 10 dual lands at common, five trial lands at uncommon, 10 signets at uncommon. There's even the Zendikar fetches at rare, and yes, Shimmering Grotto is somehow back in the set again um, for desperation fixing. You can... Uh, I, I, I'm assuming you're going to be able to draft a whole bunch of colors uh, if, if you want to try it. Yeah, I think most of the time, uh, if you get the fixing, the, the, the good cards will flow. Yeah. And there's, it seems like there's enough fixing to support one of these at the table. I don't know if you could easily support two. At least one of the two is not going to have great mana. Yeah, and that, of course, is the absolute key. Uh, one other thing to consider with these is that it's okay to go four colors. Sometimes it happens that you look down at your fixing that you've drafted after the first pack, and it's just kind of nicely covering four colors but leaving one color out. Um, that does happen sometimes. It, you know, Just go with it if that's the case. Yeah, you're going to give up a little bit if you open up a sweet bomb with that color in it, but uh, yeah, what are you going to do? Uh, Four-color decks are easier to cast. You're also just going to go three colors. Like, Don't, don't be yeah. tunnel visioned into being a five-color deck. Like. Yes, if the mana gets there, sure. But if not, like, there's no shame in being like a three-color control deck, whatever those three colors are. Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming that you'll want to lean towards the shards, just given that, you know, like the Trilands do it and that, and that the payoffs, um, you know, are there. I mean, I can tell you, like, straight away that all of the, the three-colored uncommons are in this set, you know, the the Woolly Thoctars and the, the Pancake Flippers and those type of cards. They're all here. And, uh, you know, those can be some pretty powerful payoffs, including the Grixis one. They actually got rid of the the one that was there, the 4-2 First Strike Unearth guy, and, and they replaced it with Sidrax's Spectre. Do you remember that card, Luis? Uh, I do. That's the 3-2 with Unearth that when they discard a card when you hit them. Yeah, and Is it costs that Grixis. Just... Yeah, that's an uncommon <laughs> now, by the way. Like, that, that was a rare that was before. A power rare. Yeah, so now it's an uncommon. Like, again, this is one of those rarity shifts. So, yeah, don't be afraid to go into a shard in this as well. It looks like they're really well supported. Let's take a look at a couple of... I was not, not as well acquainted with the non-Esper shards and shards of Alara. So. <laughs> is that all you drafted? <laughs> I probably drafted an Esper more than the other put, put together, yes. What? Wow. That that was the first set. You know, that was my first set that I got to, like... That's the first pre-release I went to, for example. And that was the first oh, set wow. that, like, I had... I knew the rules of Magic more or less and, and was, you know, really playing it. So I, I drafted a whole bunch of stuff. I used to draft Bant a lot. I was and, in uh, slightly different position, but uh, I didn't know how to draft very well. I will admit <laughs> that. I just forced Esper every time, and my record in, like, premier events that year was very good because I just forced Esper and everyone knew it. It was, it was kind of like... They just got out of your way? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Really? Because <laughs> all I did was do videos and write articles about how I was drafting Esper, and I would just be in a draft in, like, the top end of a Grand Prix and just... Or, you know, in, in a Pro Tour and just... People would just not draft Esper cards around me. I always draft Esper, and I just did, that was a good season for me. That's hilarious. Um, I did not know how to draft, though, to be clear. This was not good drafting. This is very poor drafting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 there's that story. Somebody back in the day, what I think they used to wear a shirt that said, I draft white or something. That was or... uh, Zvi Mashowitz, Hall of Famer. He uh, wore a shirt to the Odyssey Torment Judgment. Did not know that was Zvi. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I don't remember what the shirt exactly said, but basically it implied that he would draft white when it was supposed to – it was just the worst color by a lot. But he was declaring to the table that he was forcing white, which was a dubious tournament legality. I guess they let him do it, but it seems a little weird. Yeah. Either way, he, he just forced white and everyone knew it, and his goal was to – cut off white even though it was the worst color if he was the only one at the table drafting it i don't think it actually worked out well for him because i think it was still just not a good color and 
if the person two is right open to white bomb, they're just going to take it still. Yeah, they're, they're just going to take it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let, let's talk about a few of these archetypes before we uh, get to the takeaways here. I just wanted to touch on a few just to give the listeners just a taste of some of the type of cards and some of the type of strategies that they're looking yeah. at. Part you of know, it too is, is we haven't actually drafted. Yeah, this I, I can't out, say so it with we any. We can give you the top level view, but yeah, that, I just wanted yeah. to touch on them just so that people had an and this idea. This isn't like, and these cards aren't rated in order either. To be clear, no, and these they're, are in fact cards they're that are relevant. In fact, they're just cards that I just picked from like reading articles and looking at this, the uh, preview card image gallery. So let's start with green, white, populate. Um, we mentioned it before. This uses the populate mechanic to generate a flood of tokens uh, with which to kill your opponent. You know, ideally, you'd use something to try to pump them all up. Um, and in fact, there are a few cards in here that do it. Uh, you know, so some of the cards, Call of the Conclave, that's green, white, and it makes a 3-3 three, three, uh, token for you. So that's, you know, two mana for a three, three, and then works really well with populate. To make a cent army. Yes, exactly. And you know, this, this touches on what Luis mentioned earlier about populate is that, uh, the next card, for example, eyes in the skies is a three and a white and you get a, a one, one flyer and then you populate. And so, you know, on its surface, you get a one, one flyer plus another one, one flyer. So that's pretty good. Um, but Again, if you play, let's say, a Call of the Conclave first and you make a Centaur token, the Ice in the Skies makes a 1-1 flyer, but then you can pick any token creature you have to copy with Populate. And so you could populate another 3-3, for example, and start to really go off with that. Yeah, that, that's really where you'd rather be. You'd rather be populating well, 3-3s than 1-1s. I mean, you, the cards are costed such that Eyes in the Skies does not compare favorably to like scatter the seeds from uh, previous Modern Masters in terms of making 1-1s. Right. But when you're copying a 3-3, three, three, four mana for a 3-3 three, three and a 1-1 one, one flyer is a pretty good deal. Yeah. Um, there's other cards that kind of fit in that aren't so populate specific. Uh, one of them that, that has been sort of a uh, perennial favorite in oh, these Master Modern Stick. Masters sets <laughs> yeah, is Penumbra Spider. And this card is just horrifically annoying if you're trying to beat down. But oh, it is when, when awesome. Like on a 3-2 and a 2-2 two, two in play and you just got a removal spell in hand and you curve that, you're like, yeah, this is good. They play a Penumbra Spider. It's a 2-4 and, di- and it dies into another 2-4 and you're just like... Yeah, and, and they both have reach. Yeah, the card is one of the most frustrating to play against and it's one you will see in those five-color decks often as well. Uh, another one is Attended Knight, a card we haven't seen uh, in a little while. It's, it's two and a white for a 2-2 two, two with first strike and when it enters the battlefield, you get a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token. So, you know, again, this isn't exactly going off, but, you know, there's a few little things to pick up here and there. Um, and then uh, as far as the payoffs go, uh, intangible virtue is a big one. One and a white enchantment creature tokens you control get plus one, plus one and have vigilance. And Luis, this is a perfect example, by the way, of what we were talking about earlier with a card that no other deck wants, period. Yeah. They just don't even see that in the pack. It'll go so late. Um, yet for your it deck, it might be your best, best card. card. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just like so the that, that's, that's the payoff. Yeah, so that's your big payoff. So, you know, that that's one of the ones to consider um, as well. And then the other one, uh, w- which is going to do pretty good work for you uh, among, uh, excuse me, along the similar vein is uh, Gaia's Anthem. This is one green green for an enchantment. And it says uh, creatures you control get plus one, plus one. So, again, it rewards you for it? having multiple creatures. What, no, what did they, you say? This, mm-hmm. Go ahead. I said color shifted glorious Anthem. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. So, yeah, so that, you know, that gives you an idea. This is one of the more straightforward decks. You're going to want cards that say populate, cards that make tokens, and cards that pay you off for having a lot of creatures on the battlefield. Done. That's what you want to do with green, white, populate. Um, let's take a look at this next one, black, red, unearth, and sacrifice. Um, this is a pretty cool one. Looks like I actually forgot to put a key card on here. Uh, what is that thing called? What is the, I can't remember if they, they, they put, um, I think it's. I think they put Vampire Aristocrat in this set, but it might be, um, what's it called, uh, Nentuko Husk, but whatever. They're the same card. Um, yeah. dr- you know, so Vampire Aristocrat, which I do think it is in, is in Modern Masters, is, is two and a black for a two two. You can sacrifice a creature to give it plus two plus two until end of turn. So it's a uh, it's a sacrifice outlet, and it, it it you might think right away, well, that's really cool. Um, I can make my vampire aristocrat very large. And yes, that is true. And it can mess with combat. You can do this at instant speed any old time you want. But the truth is just having the ability to sacrifice a creature actually ends up being the more powerful thing than attacking with a very large uh, creature on the ground. That actually isn't doesn't end up being the end game because there's cards like 
Falconrath Noble, which is three and a black for a 2-2 flying. It says whenever Falconrath Noble or another creature dies, that's anything, a target player <laughs> loses a life. Sensible. Yeah, which is insane. Uh, target player loses one life and you gain one life. Yeah. That's uh, common. Funny aside, I uh, once bet lunch uh, on Falconrath Noble being able to target your opponent versus – or target yourself versus not. I thought it was only an opponent. I did not win mm. that bet. You do. <laughs> Sad. <laughs> um, and then, you know, the, the, you're, you must be thinking at this point, okay, well, if I'm going to do this sacrifice thing, well, what am I sacrificing? Well, there's a bunch of cards in the format. The dregs of the format. Indeed. Uh, Dragscape Zombie being one of them uh, that, that have unearthed. They, they let you get the card back, you know, for value, basically. And so a card like Dragscape Zombie, for example, is a real simple one. It's one in a black for a 2-1 zombie. And it's got unearth for black mana. If you pay black, you return it from your graveyard to the battlefield. It gets haste and you exile you exile it at the beginning of the next end step or if it would leave the battlefield and you can only unearth as a sorcery. But the key here is that you have a dragscape zombie. You, for example, sacrifice it to your uh, vampire aristocrat. <clears throat> and you have a Falconrath Noble out. So just by doing this, the Drayscape Zombie goes away, the Falconrath Noble drains your opponent for one, and your Vampire Aristocrat gets plus two, plus two until end of turn. Then you can pay black to bring back the zombie and do that all over again. And this might seem not mind-blowingly great, but I'm telling you, it adds up in a very, very big way. It, it, it is over time, though. Uh, you know, the, these decks yeah. really can kind of grind you down. And one of the ones we mentioned, Luis, was Mortician Beetle, which is t uh, rarity shifted to common it, from rare. It's black for a 1-1. One, one. Whenever a player sacrifices a creature, you can put a counter on it. Plus one, plus one counter. Either. Yeah. Uh, put a plus one, plus one yeah, counter. Yeah. It's worth noting that Unearth is also like a kind of intrinsically aggressive mechanic because if you're yeah. not comboing all you're doing is just extra damage out of your creatures so this deck does care about life pills. this is not one of those synergy decks that you just kill your opponent from 30 or whatever they actually do want to get you down to like 12 and then sneak in that damage like we're not talking huge combos here we're talking double sacrificing creatures to drain them so totally it's, and you know it's definitely a chip damage deck definitely and 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 unearth is absolutely lined up to do that. Another card that comes to mind is Bone Splinters. Black mana for a sorcery as an additional cost to cast it. You sacrifice a creature, so that triggers all the things that we mentioned, and you destroy target creatures. So for example, you could do it with the synergies that I put out earlier, but another one you can do is you can unearth a creature, maybe even get in an attack with it, and then Bone Splinters it away to kill something much bigger. You just have so many uh, expendable creatures. They're all just fodder you know, for these things. And, uh, and, and it really does start to add up when you get a premium removal spell like bone splinters for effectively free, you know, that, that is the type of scenario that you want to be in for sure. Uh, when you're trying to get stuff out of the way and chip in for, for chunks of damage. Yeah. The, the way this goes wrong, by the way, is not having enough sacrifice fodder. I think that is going to be the more likely scenario because the fodder or the outlets. I, I think the actual fodder is, is one okay. of the, cause, cause a card like Bone Splinters is so bad when you're just sacking a normal creature. Oh, sure, and the same yeah. is true of Vampire Aristocrat. Whereas cards like Cathari Bomber, Dregscape Zombie, and Falcon Wrath Noble kind of at least justify themselves. Mm -hmm. It's just much worse to not end up with uh, ways to sac or to the things to sacrifice and these underpowered cards that require sacrifices than the other way around. Yeah. Um, remember, there's some cool uh, cross synergies here as well to keep your eye on. And I, I, I don't. You know, I'm obviously not trying to bring this up as a topic on the show, but this is the type of thing that you should be thinking about when you try to evaluate Modern Masters. Is remember when we said red green was a aggro token type build? Well, that means that you can use the tokens from red. You know, for example, I brought up dragon fodder as an example, one in a red, and you get two literal one fodder. one goblins. <laughs> yes, literal fodder, right? Uh, there's another card. Goblin Assault, two and a red enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, create a 1-1 one, one red, red goblin creature token with haste. Goblin creatures attack each turn of Fable. You know, these are all things that you can just sack away to the to the different sacrifice outlets this over and over again, too. Blossom, by the way. What's that? <laughs> this was not the Red Bitter Blossom, by the way. People thought that it might be. <laughs> <No>. Woody tried <laughs> to, yeah. I, I won't throw him under the bus too hard, but, but Woody and I built a deck uh, around that card using uh, <clears throat> Eldrazi... Temple? Is that what it was? No, not Temple. Monument. <laughs> that was sweet. Oh, sure. The, 
all your creatures get plus one plus one flying and indestructible, but you have to eat a creature every turn. Yeah, so you could just have it, you know, that basically took care of itself and then the rest just got to jam. Um, one more to take a look at um, is Bant. This is green, white, blue, and it says you think Splicers. This is a deck that we're going to like to draft more than the aggressive red black sacrifice deck, or no? Uh, I do think that. Uh, <laughs> I, I do, though I'm not convinced that Splicers is going to end up being exactly what it does. But this is using the splicer cards that we talked about earlier, the ones where you play a creature and then you get the 3-3 the three, three golem with them. Um, and then, you know, you can blink them or recur them. Uh, you can take advantage of populate cards because this does have green and white as part of the, the shard color here. Um, and you can kind of go off. So, so some of the examples um, of, of the different types of, of, of splicers that you might uh, take is, is uh, wing splicer, three and a blue for a 1-1. One, one. And uh, when it enters the battlefield, you get that 3-3 artifact golem token. And uh, golem creatures you control, in this case, have, as you, might imi- as you might imagine, flying. So that's pretty good. I feel uh, like you didn't need to say that. And, and if people yes. didn't get that wings meant flying, then... <laughs> well, I think if we said it later, maybe. But if you've never seen one, it might be like, you know, I don't, I don't really get how this works. Like never, if I told never you... Seen a wing? No, no, no. A splicer before. Like if I told you master splicer is three and a white for a 1-1... One, one, and you get the 3-3, three, three, and golem creatures you control get plus one, plus one. You'd be like, oh, I see. It does a thing to all the golems. Then if I told you Wing Splicer, yes, I, I would expect you to understand. All right. I'll give, I'll give the, the people who don't know what wings are a pass. Can, can we give them a walk? Thank you. Um, no, no, another, not a walk. Fly. <laughs> a fly. Another one is a Vital Splicer, three and a green for a 1-1. One, one, and you get the token, and you can pay one mana to regenerate targum, target golem creature you control. Or excuse me, target golem you control. So lots of cool stuff with that, right? I mean, we're, we're seeing a whole lot of cross synergies that will come in. And, uh, and, and, and then, of course, there's all the normal value cards that you get out of a Bant deck as well. Uh, you know, we talked about Flicker Wisp. This is another one of those ones where I'm like, well, that would go just fine in this deck as well. You can flicker one of your splicers, get another uh, golem, and, and start going to town. So there's a whole lot here. Um, these sets are complicated. Like What'd you say? I'm not even going to mention Mist Raven. It's like your favorite card. I, I talked about it a bunch last week. All right. Well, Mist Raven's here. And, yes, uh, Mist Raven is here. I, I don't want to overhype it. I don't want people taking them from me when I sit down to do, draft. Do you own the original art to Mist Raven? I wish. No, it's it's digital. It was, it was made by John Avon. I, I know that yeah. stuff, but I, I can't. You can't buy it. Um, I'll probably get a print of it, maybe, but I, I don't know if I really want to. Anyway, uh, so takeaways. <laughs> Let's talk takeaways here, Luis, because before we set our listeners free upon the world and. Uh, you know, as the set comes out in a week or so, um, when you draft this format, try your best to pick your lane and stick to it. And what I mean by that is be choosy about what lane you get in, but then when you get into it, stay there and don't be afraid to uh, take the synergy base pick. Synergies will rule the day and you can't be afraid to take cards that look kind of unexciting, like the ones we talked about earlier, but all of a sudden, you, Eyes in the skies and dregscape zombies. Yeah, exactly. These type of cards that are just like, well, that's not, you know, like, for example, this this is, I think, where things really diverge. If you were playing cube, you would never want to take a card like Eyes in the Skies or dr- even Dregscape. They're just so boring and low, you know, low impact. You, you're looking for big, splashy, rares and powerful stuff. And this is why I said I don't think that, that Modern Master sets really fit the criteria of cube or a regular set. It's more like a pumped up regular set than a dumbed down cube in my mind because of this. Um, and you don't be afraid though to take those cards over cards that look more powerful on the surface. Once you get the engine rolling for most of these archetypes, and we'll of course sort it out as we go through which ones are the ones really worth going for, you'll see how it all comes together and produces a much, much better outcome than uh, if you just try to take a big pile of very good cards. That'll only get you so far. Uh, th- these You'll see your opponent start to pile up absurd synergies and you're going to look down at your you know Penumbra Spider and be like, well, I thought this was a really good card, or but you know my opponent is just doing broken, stupid stuff. And then you know if you can't seem to find your lane, maybe just take Mana Fixing early and, and try to go for the four or five color deck. Uh, I know that that's going to be one of my defaults, at least at the beginning. I do want to say, too... You know, we mentioned that this is, you know, obviously a, a format that's a little more expensive to draft. A lot of listeners aren't going to do very many of them. This is actually one of the better formats to just do like one or two drafts in, because if you know what the the baseline archetypes do, you don't actually have to know quite as much format knowledge to draft them successfully. Whereas a normal limited format, you kind of have to know the ins and the outs of the format, and like your red green decks can look very different from each other. 
look, your you know blue white blink or green white populate decks are just not going to look all that different from each other if you know what the baseline archetype is going to be. So you can actually do a little more uh, advanced reading and homework on this format if if you know you're only going to draft it once or twice. You don't have to worry about like there's not as much of a learning curve even though there still is one. But I didn't draft Modern Masters a whole lot of times before I you know played in a Grand Prix with it because it was just hard to get the packs. So and I felt pretty good drafting it because I just knew what the different archetypes were going to be. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, it's actually one of the things that might be cited as a weakness of these formats is that for those of us that, especially online, want to try to go infinite and play it a whole bunch, is that, you know, when you're halfway through pack one and you do know what lane you're in and it's open, you can't, the question isn't what is my deck going to look like? It's just how good of a version of this archetype am I going to have? And once you've sort of explored all the archetypes and found your favorites, you can kind of hit a wall where you're like, well, I kind of know how this is going to go because it does create an interesting scenario where with less overlap among strategies, normally that just comes down to colors for a regular set. But for this, it, it comes down to archetypes. If everybody got into their own lane, everybody would be happier, but you also would know a lot about what your deck is going to look like by the end. And it was just a question of how powerful is it versus, you know, in a normal draft format, I could be blue red and not know what my deck, am I going to be more towards the, like in the current set, improvise range of the spectrum, or am I going to be, uh, you know, a little bit more aggressive or, you know, what does my deck like actually look like? Blue red aggro deck with even yeah. vehicles if you want. Yeah, some Fires. vehicles and tempo cards or, and frontline rebels. Yeah. Much removal and, and some value cards. Like the, there, there are ways to go that are different more so than in modern masters where if you know what each color pair does, you are actually more good to go than you would be normally. Yeah, totally. Uh, these sets are super, super, super fun, though. I love these also, sets. Know, know which cards are uh, sought after and valuable. Oh, we <laughs> that, can that say that a, here, buddy. Yeah, get the that, money that a, picks that, in. That is a big component to drafting these things. Uh, look, I mean, sometimes you sometimes you, you take Tarmogoyf over Burst Lightning. I'm just going to put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, he's right, though. Make sure that you do know the prices. Uh, there is a foil in every single pack. And, uh, you know, as much as, as Luis and I like to be spikes and, and uh, you know, draft to win, we also I'm not know. I'm passing Liliana the Veil. I'm just right. I mean, we, yeah, we also know that, you know, drafting these these sets is expensive. And if you can recoup some of the, the price of it by opening up something sweet, you should by all means do it. And the other thing to keep in mind. If I'm, a, if I'm doing a draft video, I'll yeah. make up some really heinous justification for doing it, but I still take the little But bit. you're still going to take the, the yeah. big ticket item. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, and the other thing, hey, you know, this is the truth too. You can get away with it. You know, if you open up a bomb and a really expensive, like let's say you open a masterpiece and a bomb in your, uh, you know, Ether Revolt deck. You, you, by passing the bomb, you're giving up a significant portion of your equity in the draft to take the money card that you're not going to play. Uh, let's say you open up an unplayable one, right? But here, you, I really believe that in most decks, you can scrap you know, a card and get away with it, especially since it's often going to be your first pick, just because there are so many good cards uh, to float around in the format. Um, but anyway, I was saying these, this form, the, these things tend to be really, really fun. And I highly recommend it if you can afford it. And if you can find the place to try it, uh, these, these end up being not unique, but a nearly unique draft experience because they don't hit Q, but they're much different than a regular one. And they're really, really fun. So please do, uh, try it out and send us your, your deck list. If you do end up getting them in a, in a very well taken photograph, of course, on Twitter orientated properly. <laughs> Uh, you, will be graded, you will be graded harshly otherwise. Yeah, it's tough because, I mean, if somebody sends me a picture of their deck, I'm always happy to take a quick look at it. But if it goes sideways on my phone or if it's just really blurry, I can't see the cards. It's like, well, there I'm not like going to. tons of blur. Like, yeah, I just can't, you just can't see the cards. It kind of is a deal breaker. Take, take, anyway. a, look at, uh, take a look at like the, the, the pictures that uh, you know, I'll send during a pro tour. I guess you have to go pretty far back to find a pro tour I actually played in. But I, I do tend to, to, to take a long time with pictures of my draft decks. Like I de-sleeve them. I put the... The, the piles of cards very close together because it, it actually does matter if you want people to engage with the thing you're you're posting you want to be able to read it it's just less fun if they can't so I, I, you know I want I want people to see how unlucky I got by how badly I opened the draft so I need to like take a really good picture of my deck in order to to get there yeah for sure all right go draft modern masters it's going to be sweet and of course for those of you that play on Magic Online you have a lot to look forward to there because it's a little more affordable and it's a little easier to kind of keep running it up. Um, if you get to draft them, sell the cards and, and sort of keep that flowing. Uh, that's going to do it for the show this week. If you uh, want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and he is LSV. The shot, 
the shot. This show, of course, is brought to you by ChannelFireball.com. Each and every week, we highly recommend that you check out their website for all of your magic needs, including free content and also everything you need to buy. Uh, I mean, sleeves, deck boxes, all that kind of stuff. You can pick that up while you're there, uh, you know, getting your Modern Masters or getting some some sealed product or, or maybe just getting the latest info on Constructed and what's going on with that. You can find it at ChannelFireball.com. And again, we, we do recommend uh, checking them out. That is going to do it for the show this week. We do want to thank you once again for taking some time out of your week to spend with us. We really do appreciate it and we look forward to it every time. We'll see you next time. I haven't talked about uh, recipes for a while, but I actually wanted to talk to talk about one that uh, I've used quite often and is actually very useful uh, for those of you who, I guess, are interested in eating steak. That is one of the harder things to cook, uh, but I've found a, a routine that actually works really well and something that I consistently get the results I want. So I think that listeners of the show can appreciate that sort of, uh, <laughs> you know, approach. So uh, first thing is I, I tend to like ribeye, but you can actually do a lot of different cuts this way. But I'm talking about like an actual like cut of steak, not like a flank steak, you know, that's uh, a lot like, like thinner and smaller. So let's sit until room temperature. It's pretty important. You actually do want to cook it at room temperature. Uh, pat it dry with a paper towel. Rub it with olive oil, salt, and pepper. Uh, preheat your oven to 400 degrees. And you should have a cast iron pan if you're serious about cooking. Cast iron pans are great. Yeah, they're uh, really good. I got two of them. Okay, sick brags, but that's yep. fine. Uh, Running it up. You you uh, heat your cast iron pan until, until it's hot, like on high. Uh, sear both sides for a minute each. And if it's thick enough that it has, like, actual edges, you know, put it on the edges for a little while, too. And then... Uh, Toss in the oven. Here's a, a critical part that really did level up my cooking game, which is using a thermometer, an in oven, a thermometer that actually, you know, like one of those digital thermometers that has like a probe that goes into the oven. So you're not opening the oven door to check on it, that sort of thing. And and here's what really made it consistent is if you keep it in the oven until the internal temperature, until the thermometer hits about 120 to 125, depending on how rare you like your steak, you can actually let it to go to 130 if you want it a little more medium. You don't have to worry about, you know, looking at it and trying to judge it or, or poking it. And, you know, when people say like, well, if it's like the consistency of, you know, your knuckle or whatever, uh, I never really liked that test or like with different parts of your palm, you know, that that sort of test. I always thought. Yeah, that I have very strong palms. So, <laughs> yeah, yes. You, when you have thick gorilla hands, it actually does give you the too well cooked of a steak. Uh, <laughs> so I usually let it sit, let it hit 122, just the temperature I've chosen because that seems to have good results. Uh, take it out of the oven, cover it with aluminum foil, and let it sit for about another 15 minutes, and then slice it, and that's it. Like I just do this every time. I don't. There's used to, steak used to feel like very high variance to me, but that's just because I didn't really know how to cook it. If I do this, it tends to come out pretty consistently. So um, I, I did want to ask, what are you aiming for as far as cook goes? So uh, as far as like medium goes, rare. you like medium or So pulling it out at, in the 120 to 125 range and letting it sit for the 15 minutes will give you medium rare. It will give you medium rare. Uh, if Again, if you let it sit to like 130, you'll get a, a little bit more medium. 135 will be more medium. You can also let it sit longer before, because it does keep, continue cooking. That's why you cover it with aluminum foil. But yeah, I, I would generally advise you to not do it a whole lot more than that. Uh, at, at that point, I think there's other cuts of meat you can enjoy. I think that if you cook steak too much, it just gets, it's not as appetizing. Um, and I had, I had one other question. Yes, sir. Uh, so you, you said, and I'm going to put these uh, instructions, by the way. Yeah, in the show I, notes. I, I wrote these out, though. They'll be in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, you said, so put it in the oven until the inter internal temperature hits 120 to 125. Then you said remove and cover with aluminum foil and let it set for 15 oh, minutes. Oh, I put it on a cutting board, uh, you yeah. know, the cutting board that I'm going to use. I don't put it on the, the pan. Sorry. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask because I think that people aren't necessarily, necessarily aware of uh, – the cooking that happens even after you've taken the the meat off of the the source of heat, and uh, that does actually continue to cook a little bit, um, even even if you take it off the pan. So, and you usually will not would need a sauce to go with this. This is actually, and I don't really marinate it or season it with much more than that. If you have if you have good quality steak, you really don't need much more than that. But to each their own. I'm not one of those people who's going to yell at you for putting ketchup on a steak. No, I will I will judge. Well, I'm hungry now. <laughs> yes. 